Welcome to Empire Building, the podcast where we talk about building big businesses and even bigger lives. I'm your co-host, Wendy Papazian. And I'm Sarah Reynolds. I'm Seychelle Van Poole. And I'm Via Williams. So as we continue our leadership series, we're going to focus on leading people today. And I couldn't think of a, a better way to talk about leading people than thinking about what traits are of world-class CEOs. So I put on my thinking cap, did a little research, thought about CEOs I know, and, and I came up with, I know this is a shocker, ladies, 10 traits, not six. So we're going to do we're going to do 10 <laughs> traits of a world class CEO, which might rock everybody's world because you're so used to us doing six. But a CEO is a really important position. And 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 really, I think the foundation of it is in leading people. Right. And so mm -hmm. 10 it is. I, I just think it had to be 10. Like I couldn't think of any yeah. of these that I wanted to, you know, not put in here. So you ready to just dive in? Yeah, let's jump let's in. Go. And Via, this is such this is such a good list. I totally agree with you. This 10 is great. So thank you for putting this together because it's really good. So number one is that they show their team and organization that they care. And most leaders do care deeply about their people. And what often happens is they care deeply about their people. They also care deeply about the results. And sometimes their care for the results shows up more than the care expressed for the people side of things. And so, you know, I think about, we've quoted her often. She's an amazing poet and author, right? But a Maya Angelou quote of, you know, I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And if you haven't made them feel cared for as a leader or CEO, it's very, you know, probable that they're not going to care about what you say or what you're telling them to do or asking them to do because they don't feel cared about. Um, you know, and there's there's a sports analogy, you know, that we see where we'll see these championship teams winning Super Bowls or NBA finals. And you'll see the players saying, you know, well, we did this for our coach, right? We They pour into us. They put all this into us. They believed in us when we didn't. And this is for you, coach, right? How many times have we seen championship teams uh, show up and they're doing it for their leader um, because they believed in them and they helped them and they cared so deeply about the results. They also do it for their team captains. And the reason yeah. I bring that up is you guys have heard me mention it a lot, but Sam Walker's book, Captain Class Leaders, mm -hmm. or Captain Class, Class Leadership, um, talks about how team captain leaders and that style of leadership is possibly more impactful in winning teams than even the coach. Love it, that. It's it's really cool. And the point is that, that they're showing that they care. They're saying that they care. They're paying attention. For those of you who listen to our communication episodes, we talked a lot about that, about how to check in and how to how to make people feel seen and feel heard. And I think that is the mark of a really good leader of people. That's so and great. I love that. Well, number two is to have high standards and ambitions for them for themselves. We talk about self leadership, right? And um, so that is really the foundation of this, of number two. Uh, you can't lead others if you can't lead yourself. And people can see and sense this, you guys. Uh, they are looking at you. They are watching you. You are their leader. They are following you. Um, and a great uh, CEO is really going to lead by example, right? They're going to uh, they're going to be the one that's ahead, but they're also going to be the one in the back that's working alongside everyone else. And this establishes trust, right? People see yeah. what you're doing, right? Uh, you have integrity with what you're doing, and um, if you say if you do what you say you're going to do, that's integrity. That's integrity as a leader. Um, I know for me, um, I talk a lot about having a great morning routine. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe it's the foundation for me of of how I'm able to achieve everything that I can achieve. And um, it's really my, you know, what we call our first domino. So exercise is my first domino. And although I don't expect everyone to get up and, and work out with a trainer at 530 in the morning, um, people see that I'm committed to my morning routine, which is, you know, I get up usually around five. Um, and work out with a trainer on the days that I'm not with a trainer. I might do yoga. I might ride my bicycle. I might go for a walk with a, a friend in the neighborhood. And um, and then at, and, and then in that morning, I'm also you know spending time with my family. Um, I typically have 
breakfast. Um, I'm doing some reading most days, right? Reading the paper, or maybe I'm reading a book. So by the time I've got my, you know, my huddle with my team at nine o'clock, I've been up for four hours, right? And I feel like I've already been very productive and um, people know that about me. You know, sometimes I'll put in my wins at 630 in the morning that I've had a that I've, I've had a PR on weightlifting. And uh, yeah. so I feel very in integrity with that part of my leadership. You're you're so good at that, Wendy. And honestly, yeah. such the example for all of us. Um, I love that. Num- number three trait is excellent self-awareness and emotional intelligence. And boy, do these go together. Ooh. So um, you have your IQ, but you have your EQ. So your EQ is how you um, understand the emotional feeling of your people. And sometimes you are going to make decisions, not sometimes, actually a lot of times when you're leading, you're going to make decisions to either pause something or to not do it right then, or to maybe do it faster, all based on the emotional read of your people. So every single time you speak, every single time you do something, it actually makes others feel a certain way. And part of leading and part of a trait of a good CEO is not ignoring the feelings of your people and the emotions behind um, what what how they perceive something and knowing that it's your job to uh, do your best to lead uh, through those emotions and make decisions around that. I can remember, uh, I was after a key person of mine had left in 2019. It was when, you know, my team was kind of falling apart. And um, I went in to tell everybody else what was going on. And I didn't have EQ in that moment. I was uh, very unaware of how everybody else was perceiving what I was saying. And I didn't let everyone sort of process their feelings. I was just trying to sort of shove everybody through it. And... um, Later, uh, you know, my team members came up to me and they gave me that feedback, which was awesome. And uh, I just remember, yeah, I just was so in my own head, you know, yeah. as a leader, yeah. sometimes we get in our own head. And when we're in our, our own head, we can't be responsive to what's going on around us. Because I'm sure if I'd taken a breath and looked at everybody's reactions, I would have behaved in a different way. And so, of course, it was a good learning experience yeah. for me. Yeah. Well, and I love that emotional intelligence is one of our core intelligences that we can impact, change, and grow. Um, Mm -hmm. Whereas your IQ, a lot of times it it is what it is, your EQ, uh, you can really increase and improve. And so this is an opportunity if you feel like you're short in this area or you've maybe received some feedback like that, you can actually change it and grow it and develop it. And so it's it's really nice that this is one you can move the needle on in a big way um, with some time and energy put into it. So true say. Yeah, EQ has been a a big part of my leadership growth journey. And um, I share about it, I talk about it pretty openly and pretty frequently because there's five components of EQ and the two that I work on the most are emotional regulation and then this one that we're talking about, which is um, my impact on others. Mm -hmm. And I have learned over the years that I'm not the only one that um, understanding truly how we're perceived to others, how we show up, how we land, um, and and how important we are to the people we lead. You know, all of that is, is part of this. And when we're talking about leading people and we're talking about being a world-class CEO, uh, a company of one or a company of 10,000, you know, whatever that is, uh, I, I just think EQ cannot be skipped. It has to be on here. Mm-hmm. And, and we have to just understand, we have to be self-aware of how we show up, how we look, but also as a leader, we have to be self-aware of what our strengths and weaknesses are so we can hire around that and and not try to bring the organization down with being good, not great at things too. So it's not just, you know, it's not just, it's self-awareness of skills and traits and talents too, I think. So I love this one. Uh, Number four is a world-class CEO gets buy-in and engagement with stakeholders. So stakeholders can mean your team, it can be in your clients and customers, it could be in a board potentially, it could mean an advisory council, it, it can mean, you know, everyone that, that's related to your company. And and what I meant by this and what I see with this is this isn't a good CEO and leader of people isn't an authoritarian, do this, do that. They're not a drill sergeant. 
Um, sometimes they might have to show up that way, but hopefully what they're doing is they're getting people to buy into why they're doing what they're doing. And they're getting people to understand why they're working so hard or why they're doing this task or this task task. And they're understanding what their job contributes to the greater whole. They're understanding why we're, we're doing this initiative or not doing this initiative, right? Buy-in is one of the things I, I probably work harder on buy-in the, the the higher I get as a leader, the more I work in buy-in, and the more mm. I work on on getting uh, engagement and getting people to to really be all in, even if they don't agree. Um, I shared this in, a, in another episode, but but I think a large part of this, and I'd be curious to hear your guys' take. But I think a large part of buy-in is 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 that concept of giving everybody a voice, if not necessarily a vote. Mm-hmm. Yes, Via. I, I think I'm a big believer in this. And I think to, when you're in a growing organization where you're then like one of the ways that I that I have found to do this and that has really helped is like sometimes when you're growing, you're promoting um, the same level of people, but you're making right now they're the same level, but one of them's about to be the boss of the other mm-hmm. one. Right. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I was talking to my leaders about this this week is like, because we are seeing some failure in some uh, an internal promotion we made. And I, I said, did we follow getting buy-in from the entire department? Did they all feel like they had a say that that was going to be their leader? That doesn't mean they have the vote. That doesn't mean that they were the final decision maker, yeah. but did they feel like they had the say? And they didn't feel like they had the say, right? And then mm. that's showing up. So along the way, as you're growing, as you're doing things, getting buy-in from, from the team is so, so critical, so critical. Yeah. That's huge. Then as we go through to number five, this is one that I have really had to work at learning, um, which is a great leader knows how to work with conflict. Um, They need to become a master at handling conflict. And um, this is one, honestly, I think a lot of women really have to learn, which is how to effectively move your organization through challenge and conflict into a positive outcome. And some of the books that have really influenced me on this are Brene Brown's Dare to Lead with Vulnerability. It's Susan Scott's Fierce Leadership and Fierce Conversations. Um, And then a couple of others I really love are like Getting to Yes by Roger Fisher and Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. Um, And I know that's a bunch. Clearly, I had a lot of learning to do in that uh, realm. But really, if you can effectively help people lead through conflict into productive action, it can conflict can actually be one of the healthiest part of your organization. um, Because conflict means that people are engaged, thinking, um, listening, actively wanting things to move forward and improve. And so I now view conflict as a positive thing, um, as long as it's moving into productive outcomes and action. Yeah, I love that. And that's really, you have to have a, a basis of trust there. That's right. Like that, that, that's, what, um, that's, that's what you're talking about, Seychelle, is your team has to trust each other in order to yes. have conflict. They need to know that um, they can say things and everybody's still going to be a, a valued member of the team and everybody's still going to have right. their back, but they can, they can you know, be in opposition because uh, they might have a, a different opinion or idea. On that, with with that, I wanted to give a shout out to if you're listening and you want to learn more about emotional intelligence that we were talking about earlier, we did a great episode. It's episode number 33, so you get to go back in our archives a little bit. Um, that's called the secret. Uh, it's the secret leadership Ooh. quality you won't learn in business school, and it is emotional intelligence. So just go back and listen to 43 if you want to learn more about that one because that was a great one. I love that. Well, number six is to be an excellent communicator. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one because if you've been listening to our leadership series, uh, and this is number four in the leadership series, you can go back to parts, uh, go back to number three, right? Uh, The last two episodes, we actually did a two-part series on it, but you need to be an excellent communicator. And again, this is something that you're going to grow over time. You know, not everybody is born an amazing communicator. Uh, you might have a skill set around it, which is what led you to leadership, and um, just continue to work on uh, your communication, whatever that looks like. You want to be crisp, crisp and nuanced. You want to make the complex very simple, and you want to make sure you're delivering messages at the right time to the right audience, and be thoughtful about it. That's the main thing. That was my main takeaway mm-hmm. from 
both of those episodes, which is you got to put some thinking time around your communication. That's how important it is. So think about your frameworks for communication. Think about how you're showing up at every meeting and think about the words that are coming out of your mouth. And don't forget the best part of communication is actually listening to what somebody else has to say. Beautiful. So good. So good, Wendy. The next one is having a broad and long-term vision uh, with a focus on important details. So this is uh, one of the key parts of uh, being a CEO, right, is vision um, in both broad and then also uh, making sure that it is um, understandable. Um, and so we talked about that in our episode about vision. And so I would highly recommend you go back to that one as well about how to um, really cast a vision. Um, but the truth is, is that the CEO's job is to be thinking ahead as the visionary, but also to be thinking in today, right? So every day I go between like thinking three years from now to now thinking, okay, what needs, that, what do I need to communicate today or what needs to happen today to get us to that goal, right? And so it's a, it's a constant um, sort of switch from future uh, to now, but um, all very uh, good t CEOs um, are good at doing th th that, going from long-term vision to what needs to happen every day. Yeah, I, I think that's really a key thing because the CEO, and to be a world-class CEO, certainly, you are probably thinking the most out of anybody in the organization about the long-term, mm -hmm. right? And, and because of that, you're more aware of upstream uh, things that are occurring in your organization that could affect the long term, right? And yeah. so that that's why I think I think it's this it's this uh, amazing combination of long game, long term vision, and super tactical short term stuff. But it, but the short term tactical stuff, the awareness of that, and those details are are most important because of that long term vision awareness, right? Yep. yep. Yeah. Totally agree with that. Well, and if you if you go from there into the next one, which is eight, it's that most CEOs are lifelong learners. They are curious. They seek knowledge. Um, they are perceptive. They're intuitive. Um, they like to interrogate reality and ask questions. A lot of CEOs, I mean, Warren Buffett reads six hours a day. I mean, I would be curious to know how many hours a day Gary Keller reads. I know Chris Suarez reads a book a week. A lot of us are constantly reading multiple books a month. Um, but the other thing I love about a lot of successful CEOs is that they actually are learning things outside of work too. They um, have interesting hobbies. And the I was actually reading a Harvard Business Review um, article about this where they were talking about how some of the most successful CEOs also have really passionate hobbies, sometimes one, sometimes multiples, um, that they're engaged in because A, it forces them to detach and have white space to think about something else that can actually inspire the business, but it also allows them to think creatively. It stretches your mind in a different way that you don't normally use at work. And so um, like one of the Goldman Sachs CEOs recently was actually like a nighttime DJ, amazingly enough. Others have been pilots or oh. master potters or squash players. <laughs> so, you know, when you think about being a curious learner, I just want to encourage you not just to think and be aggressive in your learning and um, growth in business, but also think about the big life part of it too. And what are some of the hobbies um, and and things in your personal life that you want to grow and learn from as well. It's good. I love that one. Uh, the next one, number nine, is good leaders are decisive. There's a lot of research that show that decisiveness is one of the most frequent traits of successful tweets. Uh, freak, frequently <laughs> decided tweets. as a successful tweet. <laughs> New word on the podcast. Trait of a, of a about successful if you're tweeting video. about tweets. Tweeting, well, it's a tweeting. It's a tweeting. It's a tweet. You it's should a tweet. decisively tweet it's about tweets. Tweet, tweet. Mm -hmm. We're going to know who our listeners are because we're going to start saying hashtag tweet. Um, <laughs> yeah. Good leaders uh. of people make decisions fast and with conviction. I read a really good article this week um, and I, I wrote this quote down. I love it so much. And it was from a CEO and I, I honestly can't remember the company he's a CEO of, but he said, a bad decision was better than a bad, sorry, a bad decision was better than a lack of direction. Mm. 
A bad decision yeah. was better than a lack of direction. Most decisions can be undone, but you have to learn to move with the right amount of speed and get everybody mobilized, get them engaged, get buy-in to to go towards a directive and a mission. Yeah, I was um, on a coaching call with uh, Gary Keller and he said something that like, I've literally said this like three times almost every day, um, is that you can make a, um, you can make a wrong decision as you're leading, you can make a wrong decision, and but over time, and over time, you can make that wrong decision right. Meaning, you you have to make a decision. So don't be frozen to make a wrong decision because we were talking about with the yeah. shifting market how we have to move very fast right now. And I was saying how worried I am mm-hmm. that I'm going to make a wrong decision, right? And he said, "You will probably make a wrong decision, <laughs> uh, and over time, you can make that wrong decision right." Um, but make a decision. And I, I, I was just like, that is so good. Just make it, make a decision. Yes. Well, I love that. And, you know, I read uh, about a year ago, I read uh, Barack Obama's uh, biography. And what, what really struck me about that was the amount of decisions that you have to make as president of the United States. Mm. And, uh, you know, I'm sure it's if I read any biography of any president, I would have a similar takeaway. And you're not always going to make the right decision. You actually can't always make the right decision because a lot of the decisions that presidents are making are based on very little uh, information, they have to be made very quickly, right? And so that's why people are always vaguely unhappy with the president because they're not always making the right decisions, but they have to make so many decisions so quickly, right? Mm-hmm. And that is, you know, the leader of the United States, right? Is yep. is like, that's the number one thing that they're probably doing on a daily basis. So makes me think about that book, Blink right? Your gut instinct or your first with the amount of information you have is usually the one you need to go with and then you can correct it later. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Well, and then our 10th trait of a CEO is to be humble. Uh, You really want to let your people shine, right? You want to let your people lead. Uh, You want to let the work and results speak for themselves, right? As a leader, you want to focus on the work and the team and not your personal glory. And I think, you know, when we think about leaders, a lot of times we do think that that's what leadership is all about is you get to be in the spotlight and everybody else does all the work. And it's really the opposite. Actually, you know, leadership is kind of a it's kind of a crap job in a way Mm -hmm. uh, because you have to uh, you have all the responsibility on your shoulders and you're giving everybody else the credit, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think um, Bia said something so powerful um, at, on our communication episode about this. And she was talking about how, you know, great leaders are, um, are humble, right? And so sometimes that means that we try, we're, we're taught to, you know, think of ourselves as not as important as our team, right? Um, but she said, you might not think you are important, but if you are their leader, you are important to them. So I think when mm-hmm. we're talking about humility, it's important for us to, um, she was tying that into communication, right? Um, in terms of communication to our people, but it was so mm-hmm. powerful and making sure that yes, you can be humble, but make sure that what you're doing, you understand the importance of when they hear from you, how, what that, mm-hmm. how that makes them feel. Um, but the mm-hmm. greatest leaders absolutely are are um, humble. Yeah. Well, I, I think about, um, too, one of all of our mutual friends, Lindsay, kind of give a shout out to her best life and what we're doing and working oh, to grow that so um, this week. And, um, you know, she mentioned that as, as she's been growing her business, you know, a lot of us as the 11 founders have really been working to help other people grow. And I loved Wendy's response to her, which was, we all lift as we climb. That is the goal, right? We all lift as we climb. And as leaders, as we are moving up a ladder, who are you bringing with you? Who are you lifting up? Who are you championing? You know, who can you turn around at the end of your career and you have all these other amazing people that have had careers because of you? And it made me think of, I was, um, it, we live in Dallas, right? And we have our superintendent of our schools who's been there for like 17 years is transitioning. He's over one of the largest school districts in the country, 70,000 children. And um, I was so blown away that he and his leadership has created 42 other superintendents of school districts around the country. And I thought wow. that is a lift as you climb. Wow. That is developing and growing. And it made me think of like as leaders, 
who as other organizations can we look around mm. who have we inspired who have we helped develop who have we been humble enough to give the spotlight to and allow to grow and allow to blossom hopefully in our organization but also sometimes outside of like this superintendent i mean 42 superintendents That's, that was just that was amazing to me it was kind of mind-blowing so you know i i consider that a challenge for all of us as leaders to think about how are you humble enough to lift as you climb and to grow others so that when you can turn around one day, you can see all these amazing lives you've impacted. I love that. Well, guys, today was amazing. We got our 10 traits of uh, being the best CEO possible. And um, I'm not going to summarize every one of them, but you know, I think Seychelles said it best. It's really just we want to lift people as we climb. And sometimes people uh, climb past us, and that's okay, too. We, we yeah. wish them well on the way uh, because it's not about um, getting to the top of the mountain. It's really who you get there with and what you accomplish on the way. So yep. it's about about the journey guys life is a grand adventure and so is leadership so don't forget that um, so I want you guys to go out and continue to build your big businesses be incredible CEOs and lead your big lives bye bye, bye guys <laughs>